Welcome to the Wine Elder. Today's wine is an Amarone, which is an Italian wine. This is from uh, the winery Busola in Valpolicello. Uh, the Amarone region is a very small specific region in Valpolicello, which is near Verona, for you Shakespeare fans, in the region of Veneto. So it is in northeastern Italy, just a little bit inland from Venice. Uh, the way they make Amarones is very unique and very different. It is mostly the Corvina grape, although it may also have some uh, Rondinella and a couple other varietals in there, but mostly the Corvina. They pick the grapes um, when they're very ripe, and then they lay them out on bamboo and they let them dry and the grapes kind of turn a little bit into raisins. They shrivel up a bit, they get very concentrated in the flavors and the sugars, so then when they go to press them, they get a very high intensity to them. Uh, the reason that they are on bamboo mats is that any raisins burst, the liquid drains off so that it doesn't cause anything to rot. It keeps them dry while they're drying out. So Amarones, this is, uh, like I said, from uh, Busola. Uh, it is a 2010 vintage. If you've never had an Amarone, um, treat yourself to one. They, they are a little pricey. Um, there's no such thing as a cheap one. Uh, do not be fooled by other wines from Valpolicello. Um, sometimes they will advertise that they're made in the Amarone style or with Amarone grapes or things like that. Um, the, the knockoffs, even though they come from Valpolicello, um, they're, they're knockoffs even though they're from there, and, uh, but they are made from second or third pressings of the grapes. They're not the original intensity that the grapes have because of the very labor intensiveness of baking these. That's why they, you can't find a cheap one. Um, it's just, it's a lot of costs associated with making it. Modern techniques, um, they will do it a lot more sterile instead of just laying out in the open like they historically have done. Uh, all in climate control booths and everything, but the principle's the same. I'm going to really check the cork on this because it's, uh, well, it's about 10 years old. So um, you can see I am getting a little bit of discoloration here, but nothing to where it's bleeding out. So I'm pretty confident this cork did its job. Um, yeah, just over those years, uh, the, the redness just kind of migrates up. But that, that looks pretty good, so... Very fruity, very intense, very full and big and rich. You can almost smell the, the raisin uh, essence of it and the kind of the, uh, the sweetness of how raisins are. Very thick, very heavy, very solid. It's very intense. It's very plummy. You do get a little bit of the raisiny essence, but not like you just opened a box of raisins. Um, but you get that essence of the reminder of raisins. But I'm getting a little, a lot of uh, plum on this as well. It's very thick, very chewy. It's very intense. It's very decadent. This is the type of wine that I would associate with hedonism because of just its rich, rich lushness. It's very velvety. Mm. 
very bold. This is one of the thickest, richest, boldest, fullest wines that you can have. Although the tannins are not uh, extremely drying and bitter, like you'll find in Cabernet, um, and even to some extent Merlot, the tannins in this retain its uh, richness and fruitiness, probably because those high sugar amounts, because as they, they dry out the, the grapes, those sugars intensify. And that keeps it, I don't want to say sweet or even semi-sweet, um, but you're reminded like the, as you're reminded of the essence of raisins, you have kind of the essence of the sweetness to it, but not enough to call it a sweet wine. It's still a fairly dry wine, but the fruitiness of it, it's like the sweetness that you get when you eat fruit. You're not necessarily tasting it sugary, you're just tasting the sweetness of the fruit, and that's the, the level of sweetness that you have here. But very big and bold. I would not go red meat with this. Um, once again, food goes with where it grows. So classic Italian dishes would be good for this, but not on the lighter side. You would want a big, heavy, rich Italian dish. It could stand a little bit of spiciness. Um, so uh, uh, pork that's a little bit spicy, barbecue, would go well with this. Uh, Tomato-based acidic dishes. Uh, but once again, with a lot of weight to the dish, this is not something you would have with uh, lighter vegetables or uh, uh, seafood. Um, you would want deep, heavy, rich dishes. This is a great example of an Amarone. The balance is above average. We'll give it a four out of five on the balance. The depth, uh, we will we'll give it a four out of five. I'd like to push a little higher, but I'm going to keep it four out of five. It is deep, but that depth is two or three notes. It's not a multitude of flavors in it. It hits you all at once like a big truck. And so as a result, you don't taste a lot of layers in it. It does have a lot of depth, though. So that's why we're going with a four. The finish. It does last a long time. Like I say, when you get in with a truck, you feel it. I'm told for many days. Um, we'll go five out of five on the finish because it's just long lasting. It's so it coats your, your tongue and coats your mouth because it's thick and oily and you can just keep tasting that. For representation, I'll give this four out of five. It's, it is a classic Amarone. Amarones can get very, very expensive, however. Um, this is a good representation of one, but I wouldn't say it's a representation of a really high-end expensive one. So we've got four out of that. And on the overall taste, I really enjoy it. I'll give it a 9 out of 10. And so that gives us a 4, 4, 5, 4, uh, and a 9. Uh, that's an overall score of 94. So once again, Amarone, um, if you're looking to try something new, branch out, experiment with your wine tasting. Get yourself an Amarone and give it a try.